Dying Christ destroyed our death. Rising Christ restores our life. Christ will come again in glory. As in baptism, Henry Houston Groom put on Christ, so in Christ may Henry Houston Groom be clothed with glory. Here and now, dear friends, we are God's children. What we shall become has not yet been revealed to us, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see Christ as he is. Those who have this hope purify themselves as Christ himself is pure. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of hell and death. Because I live, you also shall live. What powerful words. Friends, we've gathered here to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life of Houston Groom. We do come together in grief, acknowledging our human loss. May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort and sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. Would you please take a hymnal, turn to number 89, stand as we sing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
Our first lesson from the Holy Scriptures is Psalm 121. Listen to the words of the psalmist. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. And then words penned by the shepherd boy David who would become king that speak to us words of comfort at times like these. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then words from Jesus in the book of John. How fitting. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go prepare a place for you? And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you would have also known my Father. Henceforth you know him and have seen him. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be with you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Would you pray with me? God of the heavens and the earth and of our very lives, as we come before you, now we do come in joy and sorrow. We come in joy because of a life beautifully lived and also because of the promise of eternity. We come in sorrow because we grieve Houston's death. Guide us to a place of healing. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. The 23rd Psalm means a lot to me. It means a lot to you. It means very much to so many followers of Christ. It meant a lot to Houston Groom. 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David knew all about what it meant to be a shepherd, watching over the flock by day and by night. A shepherd looks after those who are entrusted to him. He makes sure that nothing that the sheep need, they're not provided. In this beloved psalm, David's telling us that God is his shepherd, making sure that nothing he truly needs is kept from him by his heavenly father. Houston knew this about his life. His faith in God was strong. He knew that he was cared for by the Lord of life, and he himself was quite a shepherd in his family. When David wrote, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still waters, David was telling us that God called him away from his tedious, important, everyday chores of caring for the sheep to have moments in nature where his thoughts and songs were spent pursuing a relationship, not just the knowledge of, but a relationship with his heavenly father. And here again, Houston's life was lived in a way that modeled, that followed the model of the psalm. He loved being a part of God's natural world, loved living in these foothills. That's why Psalm 121 is so appropriate here in Lenore and in this county. He loved being at the coast. He loved reading and slowing down here and there from his usual demanding schedule and responsibilities to be with God. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. One of the most important things God offers all of us is the opportunity to have our souls restored. Wow, my soul needs restoring from time to time, doesn't yours? I know your answer. Shepherd and then king, David knew all of the challenges and temptations that the world provided. Though his very name means beloved, and though he's known in scriptures as a man after God's own heart, David was human and in need. His sins were many, but still God loved David and walked with David as he does with us, restoring David's soul over and over and over, restoring Houston's soul over and over and over, restoring our souls over and over and over. Katie, Stephen, Jonathan, James, Abby, Zach, Scott, and Paige, Lee, Cindy, Berta, Mary, members of the extended family, friends. There have been many tears shed, and that is natural. We're never ready for a moment like this. But you must never forget that God is walking with you now, that God holds Houston and God is walking with you now, and that God will restore your souls following this time of grief. David continues, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Houston knew of life's challenges. He had his concerns, his temptations, his failures. Just as David did, just as we do and will. David doesn't tell us that because of our faith, we will not experience hardship and difficulty and loss. No. Instead, knowing that all of life is not filled with sunshine and joy, David tells us that when we feel alone and abandoned, our shepherd is with us, can't be kept away from us. And like David, Houston knew that God was with him and would provide strength and comfort. The imagery of the rod and the staff here is significant. In the Middle East, shepherds travel light. They did in David's time. They still do. They have to, to both lead and protect and keep up with the sheep. A shepherd possesses only a rod 
and a staff. The rod is what he uses to protect the sheep from animals that would wish to single out and devour helpless lambs. David tells us that the rod is a symbol of the authority and power of the shepherd, aimed to hurt anything that might seek to attack the sheep. Houston felt the strength of God's mighty hand, God's rod in his life. He and I talked about that. The staff, on the other hand, is used to gently direct the sheep. It speaks of the kindness and the care that the shepherd seeks to provide for the sheep. It's the shepherd's staff that is used to guide newborn lambs to their mother's milk. Sometimes they can't find their mother. The shepherd uses the staff to gently pull the lamb to the mother. It's the staff that the shepherd uses to pull a lost sheep out of a thicket or a sheep that's standing on the edge of a cliff away to keep the sheep from falling off the cliff. And it's the staff that the good shepherd uses with us to guide us that we might be protected from falling into the hands of the evil in this world. It's the good shepherd's staff that is being used now to bring comfort to all who grieve Houston's loss with kindness and with care. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. God provided Houston with so many good things. A sweetheart, best friend, and special love, uh, married for 44 years. Katie, a family that loved and supported him, and that he loved and supported. A sharp mind, a strong work ethic that enabled him to succeed. But also, Houston had this quiet, intuitive, introspective, dear nature. The gift of loving sons and grandchildren and extended family and friends. Like David, God gifted him with a cup that overflowed with blessings. And that's God's promise to you and to me. And finally, David says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a promise. A promise eternal that Houston has received and all of us have waiting for us. Everlasting life. We can't even imagine it with our Heavenly Father. Even now, Houston dwells in the house of the Lord, a resting place where he will reside forever. That's God's promise to him. That's God's promise to you and me. Let us pray. Good Shepherd, thank you for your promise to care for us, to protect us, and to shower us with blessings of goodness and mercy forever and ever and ever. Amen. And now words of remembrance will be shared with us, and it will begin with son Stephen. Stephen. First of all, I want to thank you all for being here to help celebrate the wonderful life of Henry Houston Groom, Jr. I also want to thank all of you who have touched and enriched his life, as I know he has done the same for many of you. I've got a lot of fond memories of this beautiful sanctuary you're sitting in. As a young boy, I was an acolyte and lit the altar candles here on many Sunday mornings. I also attended Sunday school and was confirmed in this church and attended Boy Scout meetings as well. You know, Winston Churchill once said, you make a living by what you get, but you make a life by what you give. And today I want to tell you about the life of my father, Houston Groom. 
He was born in 1938 in High Point, North Carolina, to Henry Houston Groom Sr. and Charlotte Tomlinson Groom. His mother was a fine homemaker and full of Southern charm. And his father was a hardworking and very personable insurance man with the Southland Life Insurance Company, and his career blossomed. They shortly moved to Salisbury and then to Goldsboro, North Carolina, where um, his father was promoted and became manager of a regional office in Greensboro. So dad and his sisters, Lee and Cindy, moved back to Greensboro, and this is where he attended high school. As a boy growing up, he was affectionately called Bucci, a nickname that has stuck with many family members and friends to this day. And he had a black cocker spaniel named Wags, he also became a life scout and was a swimming instructor and counselor at YMCA camps. His leadership traits began at a very young age, and as a senior, he was elected student body president at Greensboro High School, which was the largest high school student body in the area at that time. He then went on to attend Duke University, which he helped fund by working a lot of interesting part-time jobs and working a small plot of tobacco with his father and uncles out in Groomtown, an old family community just south of Greensboro where he's now laid to rest at Groomtown United Methodist Church. Following college, he served in the U.S. Coast Guard and then entered law school at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and that's when I was born. After graduation from law school, we moved to Alexandria, Virginia, where Jonathan was born, and he worked in Washington, D.C. at the Library of Congress, and then for Senator Sam Irvin, the old country lawyer from Morganton, after he passed the bar exam. He was involved with the important civil rights legislation that was being passed in the mid-60s with Senator Sam, who appointed him legal counsel to the Senate Subcommittee on Constitutional Rights. While working in D.C., Dad was recorded, recruited by a lawyer in Lenore named Ted West in 1967, who invited him to come down and practice with him in Caldwell County to see what it's like to be a real trial lawyer in a small town in North Carolina. Dad took him up on the offer and followed in Sam Irvin's footsteps. We moved to a house at the end of Ash Avenue here in downtown Lenore to be near their law office, which is at the corner of Ash and Main, where the new courthouse is today. Ted was a good mentor and accomplished attorney. Dad quickly learned what it was like to be a general practitioner, and their practice thrived. Shortly after joining with Ted, they and two other families bought a farm out in Kings Creek and we built a house there, and then James was born. I remember we often got strange late night phone calls from clients, um, or defendants, I should say, and things were mysteriously left at our doorstep, like bushels of produce or a quart of wood. Sometimes we'd come home from school and there was a smell of fresh paint on the house or on our outbuildings. I learned later that this was the North Carolina barter system at work. Neighbors Helping Neighbors, which was the country way of life and a good way to help start a, a new small practice. He and Ted and the other gentlemen farmers didn't take this new farming venture lightly. They dove in head first and after a while they had up to 150 head of beef cattle made up of Hereford, Charlais, and Black Angus and up to six or eight horses at one time and two barns, a corral, and a fish pond to boot. The black angus were particularly troublesome because they would bust right through single-strand barbed wire surrounding our house for the opportunity to eat fresh grass instead of the old field hay. And we would find them staring in the kitchen window on many occasions. Thank goodness we had help from Mr. Penley, a mountain man from Wilkes who was our caretaker and lived in a farmhouse down by the main barn to help manage the cows, men fences, and much more. 
He could also call in the horses out of pasture and get them to come to the barn to be saddled with a little sweet feed and the right kind of whistle. Speaking of farm life, Dad told me a story one time about Ted running up to Wilkes County to get a load of chicken litter one Saturday to spread on the pastures, and he was late arriving. Dad found him and an overturned dump truck of litter in the ditch on Highway 18 near one of the farm entrances. He asked Ted if he was all right and if he needed help calling a tow truck, and Ted said he was okay and was able to get someone to call for help getting the truck back on the road. And then Dad said, well, whose dump truck is that anyway? And he, Ted replied, yours, <laughs> mine and ours. That was the way it was in the gentleman farming and law partnering business. As their practice got more established, I noticed the late night phone calls stopped, or slowed down anyway, and mysterious goods didn't show up at the house anymore. And the old Chevrolet and Ozerville in the garage turned into those boxy looking sedans with the funny emblems on top of the grill. Ted had some too. Sometimes you might have seen more than one of these tanks kicking up gravel dust on the farm at the same time. It looked like the Germans had taken over Kings Creek. Dad loved his old Benz and drove it for years. It was a 280 SEL 4.5 liter V8 with dual overhead cams. He also liked the old Ford Bronco he once had on the farm, but I remember he didn't like locking out the front axle hubs to put it in four wheel drive like you had to do back then, especially in a business suit. After Ted passed away, Dad joined the practice with Dick Wisnett and Bud Simmons, and then partnered with Carol Tuttle, Fred Pike, and Ed Blair. Dad was very proud to be an attorney and enjoyed the profession so much, I don't think he even considered it work sometimes. Don't you wish we all felt that way? Although he was a great trial lawyer and knew the rules of evidence and procedure inside and out, his practice morphed into more corporate business, real estate, and utilities over the years. However, he tried over 20 murder cases as well as many other types of uh, criminal and civil cases in his younger career, and he knew how to take, care, take control of the courtroom the right way, which was probably refreshing to some of the local judges who may not have had to pay as much attention when he was in front of them. While I was in law school and thereafter, we often discussed the law together. Although I didn't practice, I went to work for a legal publishing company in Ohio, so I remained close to the legal profession in his career. He told me the most important job an attorney has is to act as a counselor first, instead of just rushing into litigation. He believed in helping clients work out their differences on their own before turning to the legal system which is always the best course of action, and that following a lawsuit or going to court should be the last resort. He also felt attorneys should demonstrate the highest level of professional conduct and ethics due to their power and position, zealously and capably represent their clients and avoid any conflict of interest, and if either is not possible, withdraw from representation and assign the case to another lawyer. His high standards of law practice were a model to his colleagues, especially younger attorneys. He built a solid reputation for not only being a skilled attorney, but also for being very honest. So much so that he once represented a man for breaking and entering, and the evidence was not at all in his favor. However, the jury returned a verdict of not guilty, and one of the jurors was questioned about the decision afterwards, and they said, well, I didn't think that Houston Groom would represent someone that was guilty. <laughs> well, I guess our legal system is not 100% perfect. Dad's contributions to the legal profession outside his own practice were many over the years. In, 19, in the 1970s, he was appointed by the North Carolina Attorney General to serve as a member of the North Carolina Criminal Code Commission 
which he did so for eight years to help that commission's revision of North Carolina criminal law. He served on numerous committees of the North Carolina Bar Association and was president of the 25th Judicial District Bar and the Caldwell County Bar Association. And he was selected, um, he was also, he also helped organize the National Electric Cooperative Bar Association and served as its first president and was legal counsel for Blue Ridge Energy for 22 years. In 1998, the lawyers of Caldwell, Burke, and Catawba elected him uh, as counselor to the North Carolina State Bar Council, and he served for nine years. He said that service on the Bar Council was his most challenging and rewarding position. He was consulted by other lawyers with unique ethical, uh, ethics con uh, situations that would arise, and he would help them determine the best course of action. Now, if you're wondering if he had any time for anything else outside the law, well, the answer is yes. Dad was an avid reader and one of the most well-read people I've ever known. He was a true intellectual. At gift-giving times, his favorite present was a new book and a Barnes & Noble gift card. He also liked playing gin rummy, and he'd beat the tar out of you unless you played aggressively and knocked to try to accumulate points before he ginned. He loved going to the ocean, especially Sunset Beach, North Carolina, with us and Katie, the love of his life for 44 years. In the late 70s, they were married, and she inherited three grouty groom boys at the same time. We cherished our time with her and dad at the beach and, and in the mountains and at Cedar Rock and, and look forward to spending many more years together with her doing the same and even more with the grandkids. Boating and fishing has always been a favorite groom pastime. Dad used to take us water skiing down on Lake Hickory in the old yellow Dixie tri -hull, and we went fly fishing in the North Carolina and Tennessee mountains. We also fished in Canada via float plane and went bone fishing in Mexico and the Bahamas. However, his favorite trips, his favorite trip of all was going for Big Red Drum on Ocracoke Island in the Outer Banks, as he did with his father. I realized later that while he liked to fish, he didn't love to fish. Fishing was his way to spend more time with us, and that was the most important thing. Catching some fish was just a bonus. Dad always seemed to have a higher purpose in life than most people, and you know what his real hobby was? It was the hobby of helping. helping his fellow man, and giving back to the community. <clears throat> Although he practiced for nearly 50 years, service was just as important to him, and he spent decades contributing to many local causes um, he served 24 years on the Caldwell County Board of Elections, 25 years on the Board of Caldwell Hospice and Palliative Care, member of Rotary for 30 years and was former club president, and a Paul Harris Fellow. He was trustee of the Caldwell County Community College, a Caldwell County uh, Economic Development Commission board member, and gave years of pro bono service as an attorney to this church and served on its governing board. Before and even well after he retired, he would help the elderly at the Caldwell Senior Center put sim simple wills and health care directives in place, also pro bono. In, 19, in 2012, the North Carolina Bar Association inducted him into the North Carolina General Practice Hall of Fame, which is rewarded to select lawyers who have exhibited the highest standards of ethics and professional competency and have been role models to other attorneys and have re rendered a high level of service to not only the bar but their communities as well. Dad said this was the greatest honor he ever received. 
He was the first lawyer from Caldwell County to receive the award since its except inception in 1989. Bucci, Houston, Dad, Papa, thank you for all your sage advice over the years, both personally and professionally. Thank you for your leadership and for all you've done for us, this community, and the state of North Carolina. We love you, we miss you, and we will never forget you. You had a wonderful life. that. Hi everyone, I'm Jonathan. I'm the middle son. Stephen, that was just superlative. That was amazing. Damn good thing I'm not competitive with my brothers. Uh, <clears throat> so as a, as, as a young boy, I, I remember answering the phone once and an excited voice on the other end said, Mr. Groom, I sure can't pay your legal fee, but I got some real fine maters you're welcome to. I believe that my father believed in giving every man his dignity, no matter what his station or walk in life, and doing what is right before doing what is popular or profitable. And I believe those tomatoes turned to gold in God's eyes. The weekend before my dad passed away, my wife Drew and I were fortunate enough to be able to spend some time with him. It was a great visit. We laughed. Um, it was gentle. It was calm. There was grace. We played cards. He shared some humorous stories about college and courtroom escapades, which uh, I'm not going to repeat because it could be P, PG-13 or R, so I'm not going to go there, but they were really funny. I wish I had uh, chronicled a lot of his uh, courtroom uh, stories. Um, maybe I can try to do that. Some of them will just make you cry. They're so funny. Um, yeah, he loved North Carolina and his Lenore community, and I was fortunate that he shared this culture with me from attending Lenore Rotary Club meetings, have lunch, and, and having lunch at Jim Green's famous people's drugstore where the lawyers gathered daily to perhaps let down their guard and find the most reasonable solution for all parties concerned. As Stephen mentioned, Ocracoke Island is a big part of our legacy. Dad introduced me to Ocracoke, where he went fishing as a boy with his father and grandfather. And back then, the only way to get to the island was to hitch a ride on the mail boat. My brothers Steve, James, and I were fortunate to take several fishing trips with Dad to Ocracoke. That legacy is preserved. When I was a youth, Dad and his father, Houston Sr., would take me to Groomtown to spend time with a few of his uncles and help them dig potatoes and go see a few of the old tobacco barns, which were still standing. Then, of course, do a little bass and brim fishing in the pond. They showed me exactly what it was like, and I remember. And thank you, Dad, for the opportunity to experience these wonderful things exactly as they were before time rolled on and created yet another new world. Thank you for striking this chord in me to appreciate my heritage. My father was part of the generation that helped bridge the Old South with the New South. Not an easy thing to do. He instilled in me at a young age the importance of our country's history. Many days after school, I would walk down to the public library from Davenport School. 
they had a set of books there entitled A Pictorial History of the United States. He noticed that I had become quite attached to these books and as a Christmas present gave me the entire set. He was listening and watching. I still have these books, which my children Paige and Scott read during elementary school. This set of books might sound like a small thing, but they were no rosebud. They were a big part of what shaped me. My father was a patriot. We enjoyed talking about American history very much. I will miss that tremendously. I'll also miss our Duke Carolina rivalry. For every football or basketball game, we had a standing bet of $5, no points. The $5 bill would just show up in the winner's mailbox, sometimes with no accompanying note. He was usually better about getting the $5 bill in the mail faster than I was. Our last Carolina Duke football game we attended together in person was in 2019, the season before COVID and his heart attack. I, I guess we were pretty demonstrative, um, you know, at the hotel and everything because the, the hotel manager bought us Duke and Carolina socks to wear to the game, which he left in our room, let himself into our room, left socks with a note, and the, the note was great. Um, I have all that memorabilia from that game safely preserved, including the $5 bill, because Carolina won <laughs> in the last second, and, and intend to have all that displayed in a shadow box. All right, last Duke Carolina story, I promise. Dad shared this one a lot, so, so I want to follow suit. Um, when, when I was at Carolina, he was in Raleigh for work one week. At the same time, Duke and Carolina had a basketball game at Duke. And we thought we could just go over a few hours before the game and scalp tickets, and no such luck. Um, about, about 30 minutes before tip-off, Dad bumps into John four lines, and when Dad told him we couldn't find or buy any tickets, Mr. Four lines said, wait right here. And he stepped behind the ticket counter and pulled two mid-court seats off the bulletin board and gave them to Dad and said, enjoy the game. And it is remarkable, I think most of you can attest to this, Dad couldn't go anywhere without bumping into someone he knew. Literally, whether it was in an airport or, you know, he's like, hey, that looks like so-and-so. who was He was in me and Jim Hunt's study group in, in law school. Or, hey, Houston. Yeah, it was just amazing. He couldn't go anywhere without bumping into somebody. I'm sorry if I'm going on a, a little long, but there are just so many good memories. Um, the, the, the wonderful Christmases that, that Katie made so special every year, it meant so much to us. And she would give us those carolers every year that we have quite a collection now. And it's such a, it's the first thing that goes up at our house are the, are the carolers. And if you've ever been to Katie and Houston's house around the holidays, you'll see those carolers. They're just, they are everywhere and they're very neatly arranged by genre and it's always interesting to see how Katie adorns the house with those. The Christmases are always wonderful. The, um, you know, the beach trips, you know, Stephen mentioned that and, you know, we were all able to get together for his 80th birthday at sunset, which was a miracle at the time because, you know, the kids were you know, either finishing high school or in college or moving into the workforce. And we somehow managed to have everybody there, no absentees uh, for his 80th birthday. And um, so glad, so glad we were able to pull that one off. Um, I live outside of Atlanta. I live in Peachtree City, Georgia, which is about 45 minutes south of Atlanta. So I only live about an hour from Warm Springs where, you know, FDR had his little White House. And um, Katie and Dad came down one year and we went down there and visited that. And I think that was very special to Dad because if, if you look at him, he kind of looks like FDR a little bit, doesn't he? 
You know, he, he told me once that he bumped into somebody, I, I don't remember all the specifics, but um, it, it was a reenactor he was sitting next to um, at a bar in a restaurant or something, and he said, you should, you should be living history, and my dad said, well, well, who? And he's like, you don't know? <laughs> it's like FDR. <laughs> I think he could have pulled that off. I don't know if he could have gotten the accent right, but he could have done that penguin cigarette stem thing, right? You could have gotten that right. Um, I lived in Tokyo for a couple years, and he came over and, and visited, and that, that was just incredible. And um, from the airport, um, before we got back, he said he was starving, so uh, from the airport back to my apartment, um, I stopped at just, you know, this little, what they call Akachochen, a red lantern, and um, I said, would you like to try some, some squid, you know, some yakitori squid? And he's like, yeah, whatever you think they can get to me quickly. I'm, I'm really hungry. And um, so his first meal in Tokyo, I'm like, well, Dad, how'd you, how'd you, like, how'd you like that? He said, it, it tastes like fish-flavored fish Wrigley's. <laughs> So it was, it was kind of hard to get him fed in Tokyo, but, but we, we pulled it off. Um, when, uh, when my son Scott was in middle school, uh, like sixth grade through middle school, we had a pretty good run of about four years, four summers in a row, where the three of us would be able to travel up to the Blue Ridge and we'd rent a house, whether it was in Seven Devils or uh, Valley Crucis or wh wherever. Um, one time we had one, it was right on the Watauga River, which was great. We just walked out the, the back door and, and could fish right there. And we'd, we'd fish and play poker and eat barbecue together and had some really good times. And I'm so glad we were able to do that. So um, getting down to my last couple of paragraphs, and I'm going to kind of move from the memories and the personal uh, experiences to, to a little bit different, different speak here a little bit. Um, those of you that, that are familiar with the King Arthur legend, in, in the King Arthur legend, you might, you might recall there's a passage that describes how Lancelot died with his old wounds which never healed. And this is metaphorical, right? Metaphor, metaphorically, these are wounds that simply occur because we are human and are part of the, and, are, and these types of wounds are part of the human experience for all of us. My father worked very hard to not pass away with old wounds lingering, very hard. His courage and the effort he put into spirituality and the teachings of Christ healed his old wounds before crossing the bar. A big part of this salvation was the wonderful marriage that he had with Katie for 44 years and her unconditional love. Katie, there are no words adequate enough for me to be able to thank you for your devotion to Dad. I love you very much. Mine and my wife Drew's last moments with dad, because we were there the weekend before he passed away. It was incredible. Um, my, mine and Drew's last moments with dad were saying I love you to each other and a kiss. And this was truly a gift from God. And I hope I can hug that moment with the gratitude it deserves when I'm feeling down. Also, it is wonderful that dad could enjoy his granddaughter Paige graduating from William and Mary and his grandson Scott graduating from high school and being accepted at University of North Carolina. He's very proud of them. You know, years ago, I mean, you know, long time ago, you know, 8, 10 years ago, he used to say to me, you know, if I can just live long enough to see all of my grandkids graduate from high school, and back then he was kidding. He, he didn't think he had a, any chance of, of 
doing that because he knew he smoked. A, he know he knew he smoked a lot, <laughs> right? Of course he did. But that was a long time ago, and he he didn't think he was going to pull that off. Well, he did. He did pull that off. <clears throat> so now I'm going to kind of close here. We talked about our love of American history and how much we shared that, and I, I will truly miss that because, boy, he knew his stuff. And if I could ever pull something out that he didn't knew, I was so proud of myself. <laughs> or if he had something that was wrong and I could show him that, no, that's not exactly how it worked or what happened. And we loved doing that. We, we loved it. Oh, in closing, Abraham Lincoln would implore his cabinet to listen to the better angels of your nature when things got fearful and tough. If dad were standing here today instead of me, I think he would ask us to love one another, to forgive one another, to be tolerant with each other, to have compassion for each other, even if we don't understand, especially if we don't understand, and to help one another. And, that's, and that God's grace is big enough for us all. Thank you, Dad, for your example and legacy. Hats off to you, Dad, my Atticus Finch. The world is a better place because of you. I love you and will always cherish the memories we have. Hi, I'm James, Houston's youngest. I can't say anything much, too much more original than what the boys did such a great sterling job of, of doing, but I can point out a few things. In my later years, I've been writing quite small, so you'll have to forgive me. Yeah. Lean and mean, eyes of green, he came to bring his light, magnetic to many, he helped teach friendship. A classic man, my dad, and classy. A type of realistic humanist, perhaps. A great lover of humanity, definitely. He encouraged people to do their best, no matter what it was. And like his father said to him and us, son, if you're even going to dig ditches, dig the best ditch you can dig. He was open to all. He was open to who and what people are. He was a great conversationalist often enjoyed our potpourri of spiritual, philosophical, and religious talks. Though some talks were more challenging than others, and I would sometimes have to chalk it up to being a good symposium. Dad, a man of principle and character, active in civil rights, like my brothers have already said, I hate to bore you too much more with the civil rights thing, but active in civil rights, the senator, working for Senator Sam J. Irwin and Ed Kennedy later in D.C., where he, he and Sam worked for voting rights together to help pass the uh, 64 or 65 adapted articles, et cetera, legislation attesting to those issues there at the time. They were, uh, he, he and Sam were for prayer in school. That's, that was the other big thing. Um, but they took a stance of it not having to be required in school, even though he and dad, especially Sam at the time was very religious, um, especially Sam, then they knew that it would uh, be a mistake to lean toward a mix of religion and state. Our landscape can look more like a battlefield at times in this 
country because of little separation at times. Today, for example, uh, he could, you, you, and you could tell he loved his 50 years of practicing law. I remember our fishing experiences as a child and also our fishing trips as an adult, um, so as, with, as in dad, myself, and my brothers in some of these later years and even in Tennessee and places like that. He was a lover of the ocean. He taught me how to appreciate it. He taught me how to swim. A man of many accolades, as you know. He loved Miles Davis. Seeing him up close in 55 in Chicago, like 12 feet away, playing live. He liked artists like Sting, Frank Sinatra, The Embers, and or the Everly Brothers. Uh, he, he loved listening to we three brothers sing and uh, play instruments at times, together and separately. We sang in, in the choir back here, Dad, Mama, and myself for, for a bit here. That seat's back there. Yeah. Uh, he loved hearing his, his best friend Ray Thomas sing in his Hickory choirs, and he was uh, one, uh, a great mathematician at cards. And he was uh, beating me a lot in gin up to not too long ago, even at the Share Center. <laughs> he created these cassette tapes for the family, I hear. Uh, and our Paul Paul taped himself, too, for us. And those were uh, funny stories, too, though a little, let's say, oh, on the southern side at times. Dynamite storytellers, Dad. And I were cutting up not that long ago at the Share Center when we were quoting Amadeus movie lines like, too many notes. He's like, oh yeah, too many notes. Who uh, said, it was one of the guys that said that to him? I said it was the, the, the emperor of, of Austria, Dad. He's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He always loved that movie, like so many of us do. I will miss you. Thank you, Dad, for all the laughter and lines. One more of his perhaps was 4011, as in, Lord Jamie, 4011 coat hangers fell when you touched that. <laughs> I love you, your traditionalism mixed with originality. Hail the traveler. everyone. Um, as many of you may know, uh, Abigail Lee Groom, maybe better known as Abby, daughter of Susan and Stephen Groom, and granddaughter of Houston. To us, we know him as Paw Paw. 26 years ago, I was in this church getting baptized. And if those of you who may have remembered, I wasn't a happy camper. So before I begin, I ask for the same forgiveness you gave me as a child if I start to shed a few tears. In 2014, I graduated high school. Papa and Grandma Katie were there to celebrate with me in Ohio. As a gift, traditionally, of course, we had the sweatshirts, the coffee mugs. But paired with that was this Bible here that is with me today. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but he had marked a passage that I didn't find until much later on. And about six months ago, I got this Bible out of the library and started to dedicate more time to learning and hearing from God. As Zach, my brother, may tell you, Lenore was a very special place from really early on. I'd like to share this passage he had left me and just reflect on the faith that he gave everyone else. 
true man of God. I will be reading um, alongside my brother from Ecclesiastes, chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. You who are young, be happy while you are young, and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see, but know that for all things, God will bring you into judgment. So then, banish anxiety from your heart and cast out the troubles of your body, for youth and vigor are meaningless. Um, I'm Zachary, Zachary Dunning Groom. Um, of course, following the namesake of Zachariah Groom, as I would like to refer to him as Top Dog, because he really was that um, of our family and of our family lineage. One, um, excuse me. One thing that I hold held most sacred is the sense of place. Wherever that might be for you, in whatever form that comes in, for the better part of 15, 20 years of my life, this was place, just simply put. And I couldn't have asked for just such a better place. Grandma Katie, Papa, just always so supportive. I know that that we um, most likely frequented Paul Pong, Grandma Katie, more so than any other grandparents, admittedly so. Um, but I think that was for a, a special reason, a special reason from God, a special reason to guiding us to seeing his just unending selflessness, selflessness to his family, to his community, and to God. And Real quick, I, um, some of the fondest memories I had was playing basketball with him at the end of my street. Something that I normally, you normally don't see him as the, the um, uh, physical type, at least in the basketball sense, but that was one of my favorite sports growing up. And um, he, he was just always so gregarious. Um, whenever I came home from Elon, uh, saying home already in the physical sense of this place, uh, <laughs> I guess that's a Freudian slip. But um, the, uh, he would walk me through downtown Lenore, and anybody, whether it was a member of a Rotary Club, whether it was you know friends or friends of family or cousins or teachers or law partners, he would never miss a chance to introduce us because he was so proud of all of us and what we've accomplished. So from the bottom of my heart, Papa, you will be best. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Paige Groom. I'm the daughter of Jonathan and Drew, sister to Scott, and cousin to Abby and Zach. Uh, Houston Groom, or as we all knew him, Papa, uh, was my grandfather. When I was in the third grade, I interviewed Papa about what it was like to be a lawyer. It was a special occasion getting to go to his office. I got dressed up in a purple dress and had a list of questions prepared, a notepad at the ready. When I got there, I remember taking in the big wooden desk and the stacked bookshelves, the file folders and the binders. He let me sit in his spinny chair, which was a pretty big deal when you're eight, <laughs> and introduced me to his coworkers at the firm. Even at that age, I understood that my grandfather meant something to people, that he was a man of the community. And as I've gotten older, I've come to appreciate how rare that is, being able to say someone lives on a mission to serve those around them. I'm proud to be the granddaughter of someone who was so determined to fight the good fight. And as much as this is certainly a time of loss, I also find it to be a time of newfound appreciation for the man my grandfather was. This time has allowed me to reflect on how much I learned from Papa and how much I want to carry on his commitment to serving the community around me. I am grateful for every bit of time with him, whether it was catching him up on my college semesters or getting absolutely walloped by him in gin rummy, as is trend, it seems. My memories of him from eight to now will always be some of my most treasured moments of growing up a groom. There's a quote that I would like to share with you all from the author and poet Ocean Vuong. It goes, you realize that grief is perhaps the last and final translation of love, that it is the last act of loving someone, and you realize that it will never end. 
you get to do this, to translate this last act of love for the rest of your life. That idea of grief being an outpouring of love has brought me some peace, and I hope it brings you all some as well. I will always miss my grandfather, but I'm coming to understand that through always missing him, I'm ensuring that I will never forget what he meant to me, to my family, and to those who were able to know him. At the end of it all, grief has more in common with gratitude than anything else. Thank you so much for being here. Good afternoon. Even though I've grown up in Atlanta for almost 18 years, North Carolina has always felt like a second home. My family and I would drive up to Lenore at least once a year for Thanksgiving or Christmas, sometimes even both. On the drive up, I'd always be in awe of the Blue Ridge Mountains and their terrific significance, and I knew that we were getting close when I could start to see Grandfather Mountain in the distance. My life has always been filled with happy memories spending time with Papa from going on fishing trips when I was younger, to curling up and watching episodes of M.A.S.H. I would always feel grateful to spend time with him. He's taught me so many things. Little things like five car drop poker and gin rummy, something in which he would always beat me at, but also large life lessons as well. In fact, my grandfather taught me a very valuable lesson, one that I remind myself of every single day. This wasn't something where he sat me down and told me to listen, rather I observed it through his actions. I learned through Papa that the proudest thing and determinant of a successful life is the amount of people that you have positively influenced. He taught me that if you have the ability and power to help others, then use it. I told my roommates at UNC that I'd be gone this weekend to attend my grandfather's funeral. Later that same day, one of them pulled me aside and told me, Scott, I want to hear more about your grandfather. I could not have been more proud than to tell him of all the good that Papa had done for the city of Lenore and its people. Clearly, it's evident from the amount of people here that my grandfather had a positive impact on all your lives. Yesterday at the burial, myself and other family members laid roses on his coffin. As I placed mine down, I thought to myself, I hope that I can be the man that you were, one that respected others, gave his help whenever somebody needed it, and always, always put others before himself. In 1985, when my great-grandfather passed away, my dad wrote a beautiful song about where he was buried in Groomtown. One of the lyrics is, where will I be? Could it be by that old oak tree? Will my grandson come and visit me? And for me, that answer, as grandson to Henry Houston Groom Jr. is yes, I will always come and visit you. holding the microphone for me because I didn't feel like I could do all this by myself uh, after all these magnificent grandchildren and sons who have spoken so lovingly of their dad and papa uh, I felt like um, I, I maybe shouldn't even be here but I am my name is Marietta Smith and the first thing I want to say is it's my privilege to call Houston Groom my friend and it was an honor for him to call me his friend. I met Houston in 1968 when I came to this church to be a music director. He and his family had just moved here the year before and he was establishing his law practice. I moved to Granite Falls in 1971 with my new husband uh, where he was establishing his chiropractic office. Houston wrote me the nicest letter uh, thanking me for my work as the music director and commenting on the music program and um, thanking me for working in the church. And I treasure that letter. I have it in my stuff that I go through from time to time. My daughter-in-law has been helping me go through my stuff to decide what to keep and what to throw away and, and uh, what to do with the rest of it. But I will treasure that letter from a very gracious man who was an encourager to so many people. There was one comment made on the Greer McElveen guest page 
uh, about Houston uh, to the effect that Houston was a very valuable part of the bar and that he gave encouragement and guidance to a number of young lawyers who were trying to establish themselves in the practice of the law. Uh, my family and I came back to this church in 1989 to become just plain old church members and, and I had opportunity to observe Houston at work both in the church and in the community. Um, on various church committees and various community projects and I want to add in here I think it's appropriate that his final days final hours were spent at hospice which he was so instrumental in getting established in Caldwell County and they took good care of him um, Houston told me that he'd gone to Duke University with the intention of becoming a minister um, but that got sidetracked Possibly because of some of the professors he had or some of the classes he had to take, he began to question his faith, and it dwindled. Um, Houston had experienced some tragedies in his life, and he didn't handle them very well. And he visited me uh, when I became associate pastor of this church in, 19, in uh, two, two, uh, two thousand. Excuse me, two thousand three. Uh, he came to see me one day to, add, to talk about his faith. He so admired Katie's faith. She had such, such deep faith, and he would say, you have such deep faith. How do you get it? How do you keep it? And I told him as best I could that it was a matter of his having fellowship with God on a daily basis. He got to know and love Katie because he spent time with her. They did things together that they enjoyed. And they got to know each other and they got to love each other. And that's the way you have fellowship with God. So Houston went away from there and sometime or other he began to spend that time with God. He told me that he had his Bible and his devotional books and he'd go make some coffee. And this was early in the morning and he would spend at least an hour if not more in fellowship with God. Um... One of the comments, or another comment that was made on the uh, guest page at Greer McElveen said this, a friendship that began over building a tiny fence around the patio at Houston's home to keep out the squirrels who wanted to play there will never be forgotten. I enjoyed our chats during the various other projects, our breakfasts at the Ruritan building, his honest humility before Christ and his unswerving desire to know Christ more deeply that Houston showed over the years are wonderful memories. It was always a pleasure to be in his company. Houston experienced some dementia over these last little while. I don't really know exactly how long or when it started, but that brilliant, brilliant mind of his faded. When Katie called me to tell me that Houston had passed on to heaven, I thought about what St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 about here in this life we see through a glass darkly, which is what happened to Houston. But when we get to heaven, we'll see face to face. When we get to heaven, we'll see God face to face and our whys and our doubts and our questions will all be settled. Where in this life we have known in part then we will know even as also we are known. We might forget in this life, but God never forgets, and God never forgot Houston or Katie or, his, or, or their children in these last uh, weeks and months of Houston's life. We will miss him terribly, but we, we can rejoice now that he is whole and well and clear-minded in that land where we'll never grow old. There's an old gospel song my daddy used to sing about that. I have heard of the land on a faraway strand. It's the beautiful home of the soul. Built by Jesus on high where we never shall die. It's the land where we'll never grow old. Finally now, Houston is ageless in that land. 
I end my remarks the way I began them. It was my privilege to have Houston Groom to be my friend. And it was my honor for him to call me his friend. Thank you, Jesus, for my friend. Amen. My name is Joy Benfield. I'm a Christian counselor, discipleship counselor in Hickory. In 2011, a dear friend of mine, who is a dear friend of Miss Katie's there, said Houston had a lot of questions that he seemed to not be able to resolve within himself. And Katie and Don decided Houston needed to come see me. But I think it's because he wore them out with the questions. And that's where I want to start, because my life, my experience with Houston was so different from what's been shared, but nonetheless, I loved him as well. You know, as you sit there, I wondered yesterday, I wonder what family members or, or friends or associates might think, oh my goodness, he's been with the Christian counselor and wonder what he, he might have said about me or... Or how did he feel about that? And uh, Katie and I had a good conversation a couple of days ago. And she said, Joy, will you come up here and talk to me about some of the intimate things you and Houston shared? Well, you know, that could be a problem, but it wasn't in this case. Because the words and the things that Houston and I shared was about love his love for Katie, and all the things that have already been said about him. Now, I don't know any of the personal things y'all have shared. I just had 11 years of a man coming in to ask questions and to be real, to be vulnerable, and to say, Joy, could this be true, or could this be right? So what he shared with me that was the most intimate was the love for you, Katie, for his family for his friends, for this church. I won't say the word he used for COVID, but he used it anyway, and how it interrupted his time of fellowship with each and every one of you. He said, Joy, I miss so much just being there and shaking a hand or telling somebody of my faith in Jesus. So COVID took that away. But now I get to speak for him on some spiritual matters. When I first met him, I had heard he was a prominent attorney. But for some reason, I never was intimidated by Houston Groom because he would come in as a Southern gentleman. But in his honor, I brought some little yellow notes, Katie, because every time he came in my door, he would, have, he would start talking, and I'm going to sort of imitate him. I know you can't see. But he would reach down in his pockets, and he said, Well, Joy, I've got some questions. From that first day on, whenever he was struggling and thought he could, and he could, come in, be vulnerable, be real, and talk about Jesus. This is the message that I heard over and over again each and every time I met with Houston. Joy, this is Houston. I need to see you. I've got some questions. Joy, this is Houston. I need to see you. I've got some questions. Call me, please. Call me, please and we would get together. Last year, the message was, Joy, this is Houston. Will you come see me? I have a question I need to ask you. And that question was, Joy, will you come and speak at my service? My memory's going. I've still got questions. 
but will you tell them about my love of Jesus? Well, I didn't know that day would come so soon, but here we are. And in true Houston fashion, in his mind, was so sharp in the beginning. And the questions he had would always be, as I said, written down, folded up on some little yellow sheets of paper. And whatever I shared with him, whatever we talked about, I'm going to go home and pray about it, Joy. I'm not sure, but i got to think it through. And think it through, he did. He said before COVID came, he had had an experience, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But he had an encounter with Jesus Christ that even myself was envious of. And he said, Joy, has something happened to me? I've, I, I'm wondering about myself. He said, I feel the urge to tell everybody about my faith. I, I just have this urge. And he said, has something crazy happened to me? I want to buy a cross. I want to wear a cross. And I want to give my granddaughter a Bible for her graduation. Is something wrong with me? I said, no, Houston. You're expressing the very life of Jesus Christ in and through you. September the 29th of 2011, I met him. October of that same year, 2011, he confessed to me that he was a skeptic. You mentioned that. I don't know what to believe, and I don't even know if I have faith. The 23rd Psalm speaks so well of the journey that Houston took, more rightly, that God took him on. One of his favorite books and some of the notes that he left was his favorite, one of the favorite books was Jesus, a Pilgrimage. And I thought of Psalm 23. From the Passion Translation, it starts out that Yahweh is my best friend and my shepherd. I always have more than enough. That root word comes from being a friend. Houston got to know Jesus Christ was an intimate friend. You know that. Many of you know that. I just wanted to assure you of that. November the 18th of that same year. Now remember, I met him in September, and now we're into November of 2011. Joy, I don't know if I really know Jesus. What should I do? Well, Houston, let's just talk to Jesus. In his own words, he was the most humble, childlike, young man as he prayed to God and said, Lord, I, I, I don't know if I believe rightly. I don't know, but I know that I know that I want to have Jesus save me. I want to settle this. I want to get it settled. Well, Jesus met him in March that same year. He was in my office struggling a little bit about some questions. You know, by his being in the law profession, he was so trained to interrogate. But the one person that he interrogated the most, the one person that he asked questions of the most was himself. He always found himself guilty instead of anybody else. I prayed before March the 1st of 2013. I said, Lord, Houston's going to come in today. We just don't seem to be able to get this forgiveness thing settled. <laughs> Give me some wisdom, Lord. And the thoughts started coming. Well, he's a trained attorney. Let's just sort of set him up a little bit and let him discover the true forgiveness, the release of guilt, 
and shame. Let's just do it that way. So after Houston, I had met for a while, we started talking and I said, Houston, I'm having trouble understanding a legal word. Would you help me? Well, yeah, what is it? And I said, what, what does that word expunged mean? I, I've heard that. What, what does that mean? And as he began to explain it legally, he began to see the cross because he realized with expungement, there's no record of wrongs. It's been erased. No one can find the record that that person could walk free and clean and nobody could bring up the offenses. They could never be accused of that crime. And he realized, Joy, everything I've held against myself has been expunged and there's no record of wrong. And he encountered Jesus' cross once again. And he left a note seven days later, Saturday, March the 8th, 2013, 11 a.m., I actually feel happy. Joy, I feel alive. He no longer, I pray, was being guilty and accusing himself because he was set free by the lover of his soul. Another important event, January of 2020, just before COVID shut everything down. He kept coming and, and speaking of the joy of the Lord that he had experienced that day when, when he realized how free he was and how guiltless he was before God. And I said, you know, Houston, you and I have talked about a lot of things over the years and shared back and forth. Houston, I'm going to be quiet and let you talk to Jesus again. I want you to tell him what you desire the most from him. He said, Lord, I need joy, not this joy, but joy that I have felt in the past. Jesus, I don't know what I need. I just want joy. And I just sat quietly. This is probably the most intimate thing about Houston that I know. You need to know because he gave me permission to tell you that the spirit of God himself encountered Houston Groom sitting in a chair no more than three and a half feet away from me. And I sat there and watched for 10 to 15 minutes of Houston Groom silent with the presence of God smearing him. I watched his face, I watched his actions, and I watched his mouth move as he talked to God. Joy inexpressible met Houston Groom more than once, but that's my memory. That was my privilege, and he wanted me to share it with you. Another note he wrote sometime back, many years before me, 1978, Miss Katie, happiest day of my life, meeting and then marrying Katie. We really believe God put us together. She is everything to me in truth, and in truth, I could never live without her. And then in some of my office notes, he wrote this, God, I love Katie. God, she loves me. Thank you, Lord, for that. I say to Katie and sons, wives, granddaughters, grandsons, friends, peers, church members, and myself included, this is what Houston also wanted me to say, is I love you. I love you. I pray for you. And he said, would you, if you don't know, 
dare to believe in Jesus Christ and accept the sacrifice where his sins were expunged. It was so powerful for him to realize that. Look how the law system that he practiced entered into his faith life. God is so good. Houston loved Billy Graham, liked to read a lot about Billy Graham and read some of his books. And in the latter years, he read about going home and the books about heaven. And that made me think, because I looked through all of his notes, and Katie and I were looking at some of his yellow notes, and we came across some, and I've, I've kept them together, and they go back to Katie. But they, I, I labeled them a treasure chest because the thoughts of Houston Groom were put down on paper, not just here, but in many places, so that we could hear the heart of God through Houston's walk with Jesus. He loves us with the love of God that was shed abroad in Houston's heart. Like I said before, Houston never put anybody on trial but himself, and now he's completely free to know that everything we talked about in his new identity, everything we talked about in Scripture has now been made his sight. Everything is now real, more real than it's ever been before. I went to 1 Corinthians 13. Actually, I read a lot through Psalm 23 thinking about Houston. But as you have heard today, that's what we go to, thinking about Houston's journey through the valley of the shadow of death, because he's fully alive. I wrote down a quote about Billy Graham, and it goes like this, and I apply it to Houston. Billy Graham said, someday you're going to read it or you're going to hear it, that Billy Graham is dead. Don't you dare believe that. Don't you believe a word of it. I shall be more alive than I am now. I will just have changed my address. I will have gone into the presence of my God. Someday, and we did, we read and we heard, Houston Green, Houston Groom has passed, but he's not dead. Don't you believe a word of that? Don't you believe a word of that? Because he's more alive now than ever. He changed address. He's in the presence of his Lord. And joy no longer is elusive to our friend, our beloved Houston. Houston desired to mature in his faith. That's why I went just a few verses from 1 Corinthians 13 that's already been spoken of in the Passion Translation. When I was a child, I spoke about childish matters, for I saw things like a child, and I reasoned like a child. But the day came when I matured. I set aside my childish ways. For now we see a faint reflection of riddles and mysteries as though reflected in a mirror. But one day, we will see face to face. My understanding is incomplete, but one day I will understand everything, just as everything about me has been fully understood. Until then, there are three things that remain, faith, hope, and love. Yet love surpasses them all. So above all else, let love be the beautiful prize that you search for and which you run for. I will say that Houston Groom ran the race well. He loved, he laughed, and he left you a legacy. I'm so impressed to meet the family that I always heard so much about, that he loved dearly. Houston said, Joy, ask the question, do you know Jesus? If you don't, think about what's been shared today. 
Houston groom knew his Lord here on earth, and now he gets to celebrate him face to face with no questions asked. No little yellow sheets of paper. He doesn't need the Bible. He had the faith to believe, the hope to see him, and he left the love with you and me. And I close with this. The words of Houston Groom himself. Two short prayers I found in the treasure chest of Houston Groom's thoughts. Paul Paul's prayer, Christmas of 2018. Just picture him, the great pride he took to be able to pray over and with his family. Let it ring in our hearts today. And he says, let us pause to remember, Lord, your Christmas gift to us, which is so unique, your son, Jesus. It is the most expensive gift we will ever receive. It's priceless, and Jesus paid for it with his life. It is the only gift we'll ever receive that will last forever, and it's the one gift we can use every day for the rest of our lives. Lord, thank you for Christmas, a time for celebration, for salvation, and reconciliation. Help us to accept this gift of grace. And I can hear his voice praying this one. Dear Lord, thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, and his resurrection, which offers us hope. Thank you for our family, which accepts your gift and shares it. Thank you for your daughter, Katie, who prepared our meal. And this would be my parting piece to you, as Houston said. Let us depart tonight in peace and be ever mindful, dear Lord, of thee. Amen. That is my parting gift to you, straight from the heart of your father, your husband, your grandfather, your friend. Let us depart today in peace and be ever mindful, dear Lord, of thee. Amen.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we remember with gratitude your child and servant, Houston Groom. You were with him all of his life. Thank you for guiding and comforting him during his time with us and holding him in your very heart now. The memories Houston's family and friends have will forever be etched in their minds, memories of his years of strength and joy and humility and service. Help us to cherish our days as he did and to live them to the fullest. Lord, Houston's life in this world now complete, we commend him to you and pray for members of his family, for his wife and the love of his life, for the last 44 years of marriage, Katie, who loved and cared for him and received that same care from him, for his son Stephen and wife Susan, Jonathan and wife Kelly and James, for granddaughters Abby and Paige and grandsons Zach and Scott, Sisters Lee and Cindy, sisters-in-law Robert and Mary, for members of his extended family, including numerous nieces and nephews and his many friends here and across the country and world. The coming days will not be easy for any of us. We pray that you fill each with the comforting and consoling presence that only you can offer. Fill us all with your strength that we might be able to move forward following your lead. We ask this prayer in the name of Christ Jesus, who is our Lord and our Savior and our friend and our brother, who teaches us that when we pray, it might be after this manner. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now would you please stand that we might affirm what it is that we believe through the words of the historic and traditional Apostles' Creed that are printed in your bulletins. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 378. Amazing Grace will sing verses 1, 2, 5, and 6.
benediction and after we sing Shalom to you, which is a tradition here. The family and I, actually during Shalom to you, will begin to make our way to the Christian Life Center. It is this way, but it is difficult to find. There are a number of people who are members and knowledgeable about this physical plant. They will help you get there. You're certainly invited to be there with family and friends. And now this benediction is entitled a blessing. It was a part of Houston's things, his treasures. May the Father bless you with the growing assurance of his great love for you. May his grace and mercy fill you with unending peace. May your heart grow ever more tender to the Spirit's leading, and may you rest in the truth that he works all things together for good. In seasons of adversity and pain, may you be overwhelmed by his presence and protection, and may the companions of health and wisdom be yours in abundance. Amen and amen. Amen.